All right. Hopefully that'll be able to be seen. Okay. So, our central question, how is sonnet, how is a sonnet different from other poetic formats? So, what we're going to begin today is understanding how a sonnet is put together. Because when you understand how this particular poem format works, the structure of it, it helps you to understand the poem better. Okay? So when uh, we begin diving into a handful of Shakespeare's 154 sonnets, we're only going to read a handful of them, um, it will help you to be able to explicate them, to understand them. So you already are beginning to understand the language a little bit better. Now you're going to understand a structure of a particular type of poem that he writes many of. Um, and so that's going to help, right? Hopefully. I'm afraid I might need to calibrate my board. Okay, you can see that there's oodles and gobs of scribbling. So follow along with me so that you don't get lost and so that you can understand the, what I have written down. All right, so a sonnet or sonnet, the word, it means sonetto. Well, let me rephrase that. In Italian, the word is sonetto. That's what I want to say. In Italian, the word is sonetto, okay? And sonetto means little song, little song. We've talked about that before, how songs and poems have so much in common, right? So even the Italians know that. But this one, this format is particularly called a little song, which maybe you'll see why the Italians deemed it that way as soon as we understand the format, okay? A sonnet consists of one stanza. Do you know what a stanza is? A stanza in poetry? So in poetry, sometimes lines are grouped together with space in between them. And those little groups of lines are called stanzas. They could be equated to like a paragraph in prose. Prose is not poetry, right? So a paragraph would be kind of equitable to a stanza in poetry. Not all stanzas are the same length. Not all paragraphs are the same length, right? Okay. So a sonnet only has one stanza. It's one block of text, no spaces in between, but it's built very particularly, okay? Keep in mind that this is a poem format. So don't just say a, a sonnet is a poem. That would be true, but when you hear sonnet, that means it's built a particular way. Make sure you know that. So it has a very particular structure. This word I really want you to remember. I'm highlighting it. Wah, wah. It has a very particular structure. It also has a specific rhyme scheme, which is a pattern of rhyme. You should know that because why? Because it's a vocabulary term that you should already have learned. It's structured very particularly, this one stanza, and it has a very particular rhyme scheme. You're not going to believe me a few slides from now, but, but it is, okay? This format, a stanza, did I say a stanza? A sonnet has one stanza with 14 lines. 14. No more, no fewer. 14. Ooh. 
lines our iambic pentameter. That should be recognizable to you. That A in there looks kind of funky, doesn't it? P-E-N-T-A-M-E-T-E-R. Okay. One stanza, 14 lines, iambic pentameter. Now, do not write anything down yet. <laughs> this looks very confusing. So don't write anything down yet. Listen first, write next, okay? Remember how I told you it's very particularly structured? Here's where we start talking about that. Okay, we need a total of 14 lines. So, these 14 lines are almost always made up of three quatrains and one couplet. What's a couplet? You know this, it's in your vocab. See what I say when, if you didn't study and you don't know the words, that's why this becomes difficult. So, Robert, what's a couplet? I don't remember the whole definition, but it's something that like rhymed or sounded the same. Okay, here's your hint. What is the hint? Two. Very good. Okay. Two subsequent. That means one right after the other. Like your first and third hours, third is subsequent to first. Okay. So, two subsequent lines of poetry which run. So then, what's a quatrain? Four lines. Okay, so these four lines go together. These two lines go together, right? Now, there is going to be rhyme in here, but we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about all the rhyme later. Right now, we're just doing math on the 14, okay? So if we have three quatrains, three times four is 12. One times two is 12 plus two is 14. 14, you goobers. <laughs> okay, so this would make up a total of 14 lines. Well, Ms. Shabby, what do you mean? You said there's only one stanza. These aren't separated. No, but they work together. It's not just about the rhyme. It's about what they do, okay? So if you are reading a sonnet, and you know it's a sonnet because you know how to count, and it looks roughly like a square, right, Maya? <laughs> so, um, then you should start thinking, okay, these first four lines go together. There might even be punctuation that points that out. The next four lines do something together. The next four lines do something together. And the last two lines do something together. But all together, they accomplish the goal. Okay? That is further divided, and I'm going to have you write this down in a moment after I explain it. That is further divided, see my little scribbles over here, one, two, three. This is further divided in that quatrain one and two, quatrains one and two, work together also and make up an octave. How many? Eight lines, and plus two quatrains, that makes eight, right? So the first eight lines, while well, this and this do something, uh, you know, on their own, together they accomplish something too. And then we have the third quatrain, four lines, and the couplet, two lines, which makes six lines, and they accomplish a task in a sestet. This means six. Okay? Sep means seven. Sest means six. Okay? So, almost every sonnet you'll ever come across is divided into these sections, three quatrains and a couplet. The first two quatrains work together as an octave. The third quatrain and the couplet work together as a sestet. All right, that's what all those scribbles mean. This third one and this 
go together. These first two go together. Once in a while, once in a while, the first 12 lines just function together in the three quatrains and the couplet kind of does its own thing. But that's more unique, okay? There you go. So now please start writing how that makes sense to you. These 14 lines are made up of three quatrains and a couplet. At that same time, the first two quatrains work together in an octave. The third quatrain and the couplet work together as a sestet. Occasionally, rarely, the 12 and 2 situation. When we have examples, it will make much more sense. If you can't read my writing, Q U A T R A I N S C O U P L E T. This should be simple O C T A V E S E S T E T. more time, raise your hand. I'm okay, I just need to know. Okay. All right. Now then, there are three types. Did you have your hand up, sweetie? Yeah, uh, I just wondered, uh, the 12 and the 2, what did the 12 mean? Sometimes, rather than functioning as an octave, which accomplishes something, and the sestet, which accomplishes something, instead, the three quatrains work together to accomplish something and the couplet does something on its own. Lots of some things, but that's on another slide. Yes? Can I go fill up my water bottle, please? Yes. Is that enough, Jeremiah? Okay. Thank you for making sure you had that clarified. I would hate to go on without that. Okay, there are three types of sonnets. That's why right now I have to talk in terms of something and blah, 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 right? Without specifics. Because while the structure is very particular, it's very particular for each of the three different types. Let's start with the one we are going to study most. And that is, of course, the Shakespearean, also known as the English, sometimes the Elizabethan sonnet format, okay? So all three of those titles or uh, labels, let's call it that, all three of these labels you need to know, they all are somewhat interchangeable. If it's called an English sonnet, a Shakespearean sonnet, an Elizabethan sonnet, same thing. Now this is not the original format. This was made famous by, I don't know, who do you think? Shakespeare. Shakespeare, right. He took the original format that had been used, you know, for however long, and he said, I'm gonna put a little spin on it, a little, you know, Shakespeare to it. He tended to do that. He created over 1,700 words in the English language. One of them is champion. Can you believe that wasn't a thing until old, you know, Willie? So he, he tended to be quite a free thinker and try to do things his own way. And this is one of the things. Okay, here we go again. Don't really write until you hear what I'm saying so that you know what you're writing. It makes a little more sense. <laughs> Just trust me and then write. Okay? So remember how I said... Each of the octaves, I mean, sorry, 
each of the quatrains does something, and then the octave and the sestet, blah, blah, blah. That's what a lot of these markings look like. Okay. Let's start with the rhyme scheme. So the rhyme scheme is what differentiates each of the three types from one another. They all have 14 lines. They're all divided into these parts, etc. But what differentiates them is the rhyme scheme. So that's how you'll be able to tell me this one is, a, you know, a Shakespearean. This one is Petrarchan, etc. Because you will have to do that on the test. Remember, I told you there was a test um, with those first notes. It's all tied up together. All right. So the rhyme scheme for an Elizabethan Shakespearean English sonnet is. A B A B C D C D E F E F G G. What does that mean? It means that you're paying attention to the ending sound, the sound at the end of the line. So we read the first line. There's nothing with which to compare it, so it gets the letter A. We start at the beginning of the alphabet. Then you read the second line and the ending sound. If it rhymes with the first line, it gets. What does it get? A. a. If it's the same sound, it gets the same letter. If it's a new sound, what letter does it get? B, the next letter. Okay? That's how that works. So, in a Shakespearean Elizabethan English sonnet, I'm just going to say Shakespearean or English probably, the first quatrain is A, B, A, B. The second quatrain is C, D, C, D. The third, E, F, E, F, and the couplet, like Robert told us, and somebody over here who said two, I think it was AJ, it rhymes, G, G. I have a red line drawn here because this is simply repeating what you took in the notes on the previous slide. So the octave is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. And while each of these little doodads accomplishes their own goal, this as a whole accomplishes a goal. Then there is a divide. And that's called shift. We'll talk about it on another slide. Don't write it down yet. The sestet, E, F, E, F, G, G, accomplishes something as a whole, but also independently. Okay? First quatrain, second quatrain, third quatrain, couplet. That's what those letters mean. The Shakespearean sonnet. That's its rhyme scheme, and that's how it's typically divided. Occasionally, you'll have that weird 12 and 2 thing, but this is how it usually is, okay? Whatever makes sense to you, if this makes sense to you, great, because this is how it would be on the paper. It won't be lumped like this. I just, when I wrote it, when I did this slide a long time ago, I just wanted to make it very clear to my students, okay? A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Elizabethan Shakespearean English. Yes? How do you know when to switch letters? When the rhyme sound changes. If the first word at the end of the line one is stop, it gets A because it's the first letter. If the, sec if the last word sound at the end of line two is rain, then it gets a B because it doesn't rhyme with stop. But if that last sound at the end of line two is hop, it gets an A because it rhymes with stop. We're, we will practice. It's a great question and we will practice. The divider between the two and the three, what, what is that like? The octave from the sestet. Oh. Because there's something you're going to look for there. And so I have it in red because there's something you should look for at that point in the poem. Is it just after 10? I can't see the top of the clock from here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. More time? Are you good? Thank you.
Now, I have another math question for you. In a Shakespearean sonnet, how many rhymes are there? How many rhymes are there? It's simple math. Seven. Seven. Who said it? Excellent. A's, B's, C's, D's, E's, F's, and G's. Yes, excellent. So that's a lot of rhyming sounds in 14 lines. Now, I will let you know in advance. Now, I said it first, but I haven't given out a Starburst in so long except in my own belly that you get one. You said that's math. I already said it, but you said it, so I'm giving it to you. Okay, I'm throwing it at you. Oh. <laughs> All right, so I need to give one to Emma for counting seven. All right, let me remind me when I go back over there. All right, so seven sounds within 14 lines is pretty open. I mean, it's not free verse, blank verse with no rhyme. But seven is pretty wide open. Shakespeare occasionally cheats. I'm going to let him because he did a lot of really hard counting and stresses and unstresses and blah, blah. So I'm going to give him some freedom. And occasionally you will see a repeated sound here. And so you'll say, well, that should be B. But you go ahead and label it D. Because if Shakespeare wrote it, it's a Shakespearean sonnet, give it to him. Okay? We'll, we'll see that occasionally. So don't panic and think, but Miss Shavi, it doesn't work. Give the guy a break. All right. This is the original format. This is Petrarchan, also known as the Italian sonnet. The Italians started it, you know, they gave it the old sonetto. So, a poet named Petrarch created the sonnet format. Guess where he was from? Bingo! <laughs> no, that's not that. Okay, so Petrarch <clears throat> was an Italian poet, and he said, hey, I'm going to come up with this really great poetry format, or poem format, and blow everybody's socks off. Because back in the day, People believed that poetry had to rhyme and it had to have meter. There was no such thing as free verse. They thought Emily Dickinson was a fraud. Who was that? <gasps> you should study her in English too. Um, but she's one of the most famous American poets. Died at a very young age, was kind of reclusive. Um, beautiful, beautiful poetry very fresh and unusual for what people expected. So even into what I would call more recent history, within the last 200 to 150 years, people thought poems had to rhyme and had to have a very specific format and had to have meter. And so when people wrote in free verse or did odd capitalizations or funny punctuation, they were like, this isn't art. This is, anybody could do this. Well, no, not anybody can. So anyway, Petrarch, though, said, I have a new format to, for us, you know, all these years ago. And he came up with it. All right. What differentiates this from a Shakespearean? It was not meant by Shakespeare. No. <laughs> How are they different? I told you. What did, you, what did you just write down on that last note? Maya, do you remember how they're different? The rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme is how they're different. So what's going to be under this screen? What do you think? What are you going to see? Letters, the rhyme scheme. <laughs> right. I'm so happy. Okay. Okay. 
Notice Petrarch has two rhyme schemes. The only place they're different is at the end. Don't panic, okay? So the octave is always A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. I call it the sandwiched version. Notice, Shakespeare doesn't sandwich. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. He always alternates, right? Petrarch, I say again, sandwiches. A, B, B, A. Look at this. There's two B's with the A's in the middle. It kind of does that thing. So, A-B-B-A, A-B-B-A. And if you love ABBA like I love ABBA, you never forget this one. All right, so the octave is always A-B-B-A, A-B-B-A in a Petrarchan sonnet. Do we still have the quatrains? Yes. That's what those are, okay? Here's where they go funky. In some versions, he uses triplets, musicians, CDE, CDE. In some versions, he alternates, CD, CD, CD. So in some versions, the Petrarchan or Italian sonnet has how many rhymes? And in some versions, the Italian Petrarchan sonnet has how many rhymes? Four and three. Oh, so close. I take four. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, two. Six. A, B, C, D, E, five, right? So in some versions, Petrarchan sonnets have five rhymes, and in some versions they have four. Now then, look at how much more restricted your options are than from a Shakespearean sonnet. When you can have seven rhyming sounds versus you can only have four. It really is more restrictive to the word choices, the diction that you can use, right? I don't want you to go crazy, but some people even do these things with it. C, D, C, D, E, E, or sandwich again, C, D, D, C, E, E. But I'm telling you, for our intents and purposes, when I asked you to identify, for the most part, you're going to be able to do that by the third line. Because if you get to the third line and it's an A, as of right now, you would say, that is Shakespearean. Shakespearean. And if you get to the third line and it's a B, you'll say, that is, what's his name? Petrarchan. However, I'm about to throw a fly in the ointment. Because how many types are there? Three. Three. That means we have one more rhyme scheme, and it could throw a whole kink in everything, couldn't it? Okay. Now, Miss Shelby, what difference does it make? Because sound matters. Sound does make it different. Sound and the repetition of sound in certain places adds a different feel, adds a different tone, if you will, and adds a different kind of cadence to it. Not the rhythm cadence, the meter, but something else. It groups lines together in different ways, and so that's part of the reason people have done this. All right? C, D, D, C, E, E. C, D, D, C, E, E. That's where I want you. And now, 
Type number three. Hmm, we'll see how many. We'll either do one more slide or two more slides, and then we'll switch gears. Okay. The last type, my friends, also a Brit. Didn't want to be pinched in or compared to Shakespeare, so he made his own. And his name was Spencer. And so this is the Spencerian. S-P-E-N-S-A-R-I-A-N. I want you pink again. Spencerian. S-P-E-N-S-A-R-I-A-N. So Spencer said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to see if you can figure it out, what he did. What did he do? This is an easier way to see it. What did he do? He, he, he put the E's in instead of the N. Yeah. Look at what you've already written. What did Spencer do? Who said that? He combined them. And you'll know by the fifth line if it's Spencerian. He alternates and then sandwiches. See that? He alternates and sandwiches. A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, and so forth. Notice I have that red line in there again. Just like I had, I did on the previous slide too. I always put that red line in. Where's the red line? Where does it always fall? In between the... Use the words. The yes, in between the... The octave and the... Ses Bingo! Very good. It always falls between the octave and the sestet, which is a signal that I'm doing it over and over and over again so that you remember there's, I'm supposed to do something here. I'm supposed to do something here. I want you to get into that rhythm of thinking that, the habit of thinking it, okay? So Spencer, A, B, I can't talk, A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, E, C, D, E, or C, D, C, D, E, E. Line nine begins C each time, or not begin C, rhymes C every time. So he combined the two. He does use those d two alternate endings, but line nine is always a C rhyme. And you can recognize him by line five, generally. Okay. More time? Yes. Okay. Yes. This will be the end of notes today. It is not the end of your notes. Don't summarize them. This is not the end of the notes. It is the end of note taking for today. So when you finish this slide, notes away, computer out, please. Or your agenda now that we're at a break. <laughs>